Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Our Own Devices. We promise a great guest every time and maybe this time we have the best and the greatest guest that we have had on the show so far. It's a name I'm sure is going to you know blow you away. Uh, it is Tony Faddle himself, the man who worked on the iPod, who worked on the iPhone, who did, who gave us Nest devices which sadly we don't have in India. Um but is also uh, is also the sort of person who understands technology from many layers many angles and that's what he's uh, you know put in um, in a book which uh, is coming out soon uh, and we'll talk about the book we'll talk about a little bit of philosophy around technology and we'll talk about maybe the ipod and the iphone uh, mr fadel welcome to the show thank you so much great to be here and just so you know the book is out now it's uh, it's real it's selling now just came out So the book is called Build uh, an unorthodox guide to making things worth making. But it's also has a lot of advice I guess for people who are in the innovation space, people who are interested in technology. Uh, so if I can ask you Mr. Fadel what do you think uh, is the biggest reason for somebody to read the book? Well the 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 reason for the for the book for Build is that I wrote it for myself if I was 21 again if I was coming out of college right um and if I wanted to know all the things that I had learned and you know over the last 30 years in the technology business so it's really the audience is 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 really for high schoolers or university students or new graduates something like that somebody early in their career but the audience can go all the way to somebody who might be starting to think about retirement and everybody in between um it's really a, a, a encyclopedia of mentorship there's many different chapters about helping you to build your self build your career build a team build a product company business what have you and so um it's all of those kind of lessons learned rules of thumb and it's not about technology per se it's all about human nature when we build something we might build it with technology but it's still built with humans and teams and those things have not changed over the years people the human nature has not changed and so this advice is timeless and it works whether you're building tech for a tech industry or tech for other verticals or if you're in total non-tech verticals as well industries this book works for you because it's really about human nature and how to work together and how to drive the best of for from yourself as well as from teams to make sure you achieve the mission you're trying to achieve and reach the customers you want to reach in this um, in this thing on on how you work with others you know how you know human nature becomes a factor in innovation in creation is that a very important factor because is it something that can also um, it of course helps you build but is it also counterproductive at times you know just because like you know a team could not you know come together or the thinking did not align uh, is it possible that you could not create a great product right well look there's the human nature of each individual on the team but there's also the human nature of the individuals who are your customers and if you start from looking at the the why why a customer wants the product that you're creating what is the pain you're solving for them what is the superpower you're hopefully giving them and making sure you start with what their needs are and 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 build a story a non-fictional story around those things and making sure the tech marries with it it's much easier to keep your team aligned and understand how to work on those things because you're not just too many times technology companies specifically take a lot of bits and bolt them together and say look at this cool new thing but they really don't understand how it's going to impact the customer what they're solving for the customer and then it becomes a lot of discussion and debate about should this feature be in should this feature be out should you know and all these things and that's not the way to approach it you have to approach it with a a holistic view of the customer and what you're trying to do and a story you need to tell with the technology a non-fictional one again and marry that together and it makes it so much easier to then start to understand what it is you're trying to do get people aligned and then also having a a, a guideline as you build something cuz things you know definitely change as you see more and more um how you build things maybe certain technologies don't work or work differently than you expected and you then go back to your story and you refine it uh, based on the learnings you have while building it 
So, but you need to have some kind of guiding light. And that starts with the human nature and what you're trying to do for the customer, first and foremost. It is interesting that you talk about the customer because when the first iPod came up and it became such a big rage, and the customers did not know they needed a product like that. And that's a statement we heard again when the iPhone came about, hey, this is such a great product, but I did not know there was, you know, I, I wanted a product like that. So, so how do you think about, uh, you know, actually giving customers a product or, right. you're, you know, you're connecting right. the dots, but the dots were not there for the customers. At first. Well, you, you first, again, start with pain, right? So you start with what are the pains that the customers have? How can you turn and create a painkiller for them and maybe even make a superpower instead? So for the iPod, the pain was for me, particularly, I was a DJ. And I was lugging around all these CDs, these heavy CDs, a thousand CDs. And you're like, ah, oh, this is so hard, right? So that was one pain for me. But another one for the customer was, you know, they, if they wanted a thousand songs in their pocket, they had to take a hundred CDs with them. I had to take a thousand as a DJ, but they would have to take a hundred CDs with them if they wanted a thousand pieces, you know, pieces of music to go with them wherever they went. So that was another pain, you know, not just the weight, but the, you know, the cumbersomeness and, you know, having to switch the, switch the media out, understand what's on what. So all of those things uh, were pains. There were also MP3 players at the time, but they didn't have long battery life. They had, uh, it was too slow to get songs on or off. They didn't have um, uh, good interfaces to find the songs. So there were so many pieces of that puzzle that needed to get solved. And ultimately, with iTunes Music Store, you could just download things and not have to take CDs and change them. So there were lots of different pains. But the iPod's number one painkiller and superpower was a thousand songs in your pocket. That's where it started from. And who doesn't like music? And who doesn't like to have more of the music they want with them wherever? This was obviously before the internet or before the internet streaming services like Spotify, but also before Wi-Fi even existed, right? So this was a special moment in time when we could make a next generation Sony Walkman per se, um, and you could have this superpower. That was a pain we were trying to solve, and we obviously, we, we, we gave them a superpower, not just a painkiller. Have technology companies stopped thinking like that? Is that why maybe to a certain extent we don't see that, you know, those kind of wall products come out anymore? Oh, I see pain killing products all over. I just think that, you know, you have to look differently. Everybody thinks where's the next iPod or where's the next iPhone, something like that. There are pain killing products being generated in all other ways uh, in other industries. You just need to look for them. You know, everybody's trying to look for that flashy Oh, you know, personal device that they're going to take with them that's going to transform their lives like those other two did. You know, those things don't come around every year or every 10 years even. You know, it takes time for that, that types, those types of technologies to be developed and then ultimately deployed in the right fashion. So there are lots of different products going out solving pains and services solving pains. You know, Spotify showed up. To me, that's a huge change in my life for how I listen to music. Right. But it might not be in a device. It might be an app that's on a device. We got to remember that it's not just physical things that change the world. Also, software that we put on the devices we carry with us every day changes the world. If we stay on the same subject, um, in a way, um, if you talk about smartphones, do you think, uh, you know, the iPhone again completely changed the way or completely changed what we thought a phone should be? And then took the phone to be something else completely. And, and original requirement of phone as a calling device becomes a very small fraction of what it can do. Uh, but do you think the smartphone segment itself has sort of uh, you know, slowed down when it comes to innovation? You know, if we look at everything over time as it becomes more and more adopted and we put the latest and greatest technologies in it, it slowly changes over time. Look at your laptop. Yeah. Right. Your laptop hasn't changed much. It's more or less the same over the last 15 years. It got Wi-Fi, maybe got yeah. some other thing, got a camera, but it's been, you know, more or less steady. That means it's a tool that everybody needs and wants. And it's found it's kind of local maximum. You know, it changes over time slightly, but it's not going to revel. You're not going to revolutionize it. Just like your smartphone it has been, you know, has been got all those 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 really important feature upgrades. But now we're into those evolutionary things, those small things. That's just a sign that it's actually being used in a lot of places. 
What's so great, either whether you're on a laptop or on a smartphone, is it changes dramatically the way you use it when you add different applications to it, right? You get maybe a new sensor, a 3D camera sensor on there, and now all of a sudden you can have some AR augmented reality things in an app. So you could play augmented reality games or something else like that on that phone. Maybe the hardware didn't change dramatically, but to me, there's still innovation. It just doesn't come from the hardware. Everybody wants like little hardware bits that's so fun to do. We're doing all kinds of crazy stuff that's different than when the iPhone was envisioned, you know, 15 years ago. We have Uber. We have, you know, delivery services, food, transportation. We have so many more things. And that didn't require a hardware change. It was just more software that went on top of it. So again, everybody's looking for some fancy jewel like thing that they're going to carry with them. And it's something new. That's not where the innovation's coming from. And we have to keep understanding that those things only happen every so often. This is not going to happen yearly or even every five years. In that scheme of things, do you think there is going to be a big disruptor that changes the way we look at, uh, you know, technology, like, you know, talking about hardware, but maybe we don't need hardware for the way, you know, technology might evolve in the future. Well, I look at my sons were born literally, my oldest was born just literally weeks before the iPhone was launched. Okay. So he grew up knowing a world with a, an iPhone and then an iPad and that interface. Yeah. My daughter, who was born eight years later, grew up with a voice interface. Yeah. She grew up using Siri and Amazon Echoes and all these other things because she wanted to use the devices but couldn't read. She couldn't send notes. She couldn't read and write. So she was sending voice notes and doing voice recognition and all these things. And so she has a fundamentally different way of how to inter engage with the same products like an iPhone or a, or a, a you know, a home, home TV or something like that than my kids, my older sons do. And that's just eight years different. So if we look at it, I see that we're going to we're going to see new generations of of people growing up like my daughter using the devices we have differently than we use them, even though they might be the same devices. And we're going to see more and more smart intelligent assistance, not voice commands, because it's really voice commands of what we have now, but real voice assistants who can help us and give us proactive feedback on things. That stuff will be coming and that will eliminate the needs for screens and other things over time. But that's going to take, you know, take years to build. We're just on the you know cusp of getting voice commands right in a way. Now we'll get into more real interaction over the next 10 years as the AI and the tools and the cloud uh, computing gets better and better. A few decades ago, when you started out, um, you know, um, you know how you thought of solving these pain points. Um, if you consider people in similar situations now, they um, are maybe approaching these points um, or these pain points very differently, right? And, and you have a chapter addressing this, saying you know, data versus opinion. So, do you think data and the kind of data we have on all sorts of things these days is that going to change the way people look at? Uh, um, solving problems, especially in the space of tech? No. At the end of the day, if you do any, even no matter how much data you have, if you're going to create anything revolutionary, there's not going to be enough data to tell you what to do. Hmm. And that's the problem. Almost all large businesses need to have lots of data before they try something new. They work really hard at finding lots of data or convincing people to give them data to make them look, turn an opinion-based decision into a data-driven decision. When you're designing something that's revolutionary and the world's never seen before, I don't care how hard you work at the data, you're not going to get it. It's not going to be there. There are going to be opinion-based decisions that you're going to have to make. And then after you ship it, then you can go get data on those decisions to see if it's right. But to think you're going to get data a priori on something that's going to be revolutionary, there's no way you're going to get that. You might get some insights to help inform some of your gut-based decisions, but when you're doing a revolutionary version one of anything, most of the critical decisions of who are we targeting, how are we targeting, what are the feature sets that are going to like, blah, 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 you're going to have to put that together in an opinion-based you know, guide of what, it, that, what those things are. So there might be some data that helps a little bit, but overwhelmingly, you're going to go into the unknown. And that's what it means to do something revolutionary. No matter how much data we get, we're not going to be able to do those things. And the more people try to turn V1s into data-driven things, all you get is this kind of 
No one really has a real clear idea of what they're trying to build and for whom. They're just trying to get signals off the thing they use and go, oh, go this way, go that way, because they don't can't trust their grip. They have a crisis of confidence because they don't know how to understand the fundamental human nature of what, how customers interact, how you design, and how you build something very different for them that they've never seen before. Over the years, you have had uh, you know many instances where you have walked out of companies, uh, you know, uh, even um, even things that you have created, you know, you have moved on. Uh, is that uh, is that also uh, you know you have written how you were frustrated at um, how Google treated uh, you know Nest and moved it as a part of Alphabet and, and took it out of Google. They wanted to do things differently. So. Uh, um, so as a creator is there a point where you say hey i'm um, you know i'm done with this i need to move on is that triggered by something else or is it is it something that comes from inside too there are different people who have different ways they like to work i work at the tip of the spear i work at the very beginning of where the new technology and new applications can come together form those things work on them for a while and then i go to a new spear <laughs> right I don't like maintaining. I learned through 18, doing 18 generations of the iPod. Yeah. Like, sure, I could do that, but is that really where my best, where my, what's most attractive to me? What is most engaging for me? You know, I did three generations of the iPhone. Okay, I thought that was enough because I knew what was going to happen. It was going to be another 20 generations of the iPhone I could do. I, then I did so many generations. I did three generations of the Nest Learning Thermostat and a few generations of each other product. To me, I love getting in the tip of the sphere and redefining markets, being revolutionary. When it becomes evolutionary, yeah, there's other people who can do that. I love the opinion-based decisions, the stuff that's going to be changing and you really have to understand and trust your gut and build those stories. It doesn't become as interesting to me any longer to just do those evolutionary stories. That's great. Well, some people like to do that. To me, that my superpower is really in that opinion-based decision and, and those really early days. And if I can't do enough of that, then I'm not happy. And so I move on to something else. In 2022, what are the pain points that, you know, uh, that you want to solve? I care about the climate crisis that we have. I care about the societal crises that we have and the health crises that we have. So at Future Shape, we are an investment advisory firm where we mentor and invest in over 200 companies around the world, focusing on um, things that can help the planet, help societies, and help individual health. That's what I care about. And that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. And we're working with those companies that are on the tip of the spear, doing revolutionary things where they need to learn to trust their gut and move forward on these opinion-based decisions. And we get around them and help them to see and 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 work on these 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 innovative technologies to bring real pain killing um, solutions to to the world, and so I get to you know now I get to work with two hundred different companies changing things, and I get to help build those stories and and really um, and and really learn about a lot of things through these brilliant brains that we invest with. So um, that's what I spend my most time and I'm very, uh, very hopeful and very optimistic because I've seen into the future 5, 10, 15 years through these entrepreneurs. And I can see that we have the technology to solve a lot of these things like cancer vaccines. I've seen things where we can do incredible energy savings. Um, and that's what gets me up every day and, and, and I get to have fun. And the book, Build, was all written out of these stories I have to tell um, each of these entrepreneurs over and over and over about how to build their team, how to build, you know, um, how to think about technologies and telling stories. And so Build came out of that because I just was like telling the same stories every day. So I was just writing, writing these things out during the pandemic. And uh, that's how Build, build happened because that's real world experience um, with real world entrepreneurs around the world who who are dealing with the human nature, not just the problems of where they are in the local part of the world, but human nature, which is the same around the world. And hopefully Build has been helping them. If there is one technology that you think will have the most impact on, on the world in the coming years, what would that be? One technology? Yeah, or, or a confluence of many technologies. 
I think there's, you know, there's lots of different things, but I think uh, one of the biggest shifts we have to go is from petroleum based materials to hydrogen based materials. In other words, moving the way we create certain things like steel from petroleum, gas, oil, whatever it is, to hydrogen based um, creation of steel and other kinds of materials. That is a fundamental shift because today we're spending so much, you know, there's things we can do to reduce CO2 in energy generation, but we have to look at the fundamental process we use to create a lot of the atoms in this world and we need to move away from the petroleum to hydrogen based um, creation. And so to me, that's a big part, but that's one technology, but it affects so many different industries all around. We have to get rid of these a very inefficient, dirty ways we make the things we use every day. And Mr. Patel, one last question if I can ask you. As you mentioned, we have generations of uh, of children who have come, you know, with a lot of technology around them, you know, and, and that technology is evolving. Do you think they have a brighter future than from what, you know, maybe I had? I think that with all of these digital devices, you know, um, I don't know how you grew up particularly, right? But <laughs> but um, look, these kids have access to information around the world. I grew up, I didn't grow up with the internet, right? Yeah. And I was able to get to, you know, I had to look things up in books and magazines and what have you and reach out. It was very, very difficult. Now, any kid around the world can go seek out experts. Like my son is a guitar player and he seeks out experts around the world and they have jam sessions and he learns from them. Now kids don't just need to have a computer, they can have a smartphone in their hands, a second hand smartphone that is given from their parents or whatever, and they can access information to better their world, whatever that is that they want to learn, what have you. That has been democratized, not to everyone yet, but to a much wider scale than when we were growing up, right? You needed a computer. Good luck if you've been at a phone line and an internet service and everything. Now kids can get access to all of this information. Now that can also be a bad thing, but it's a tremendous thing when they can gain agency, they have control over getting things. They don't have to go through gatekeepers. They can go right there and get low cost cell phone service, high powered cell phones with compute, and they can go around and learn. To me, that's in insanely powerful for not just the people who are well to do, but now it's getting much more democratized. We now have what? Over half of the world with this access. Just 10 years ago, they didn't even have that, right? Now half the world planet, and it's going to be three quarters of the planet in the next five to seven years. That's amazing. And to think that these technologies would do bad or hurt kids, they can do that if they're, if they're used improperly, if they consume digital media improperly. But in, when used wisely, my God, it is a superpower. It's a superpower. I'm sure many kids, I know me, I would love to have had that when I was that age at 12, 15 or whatever, because I was bound by just the things I had around me. And they don't have to travel. That's what's amazing. They can get access. So to, to think that this generation is going to be better off, those who want to have a chance, now they get a chance. Before, there were people who wanted a chance who never had a chance. They can go and do that now, and they can do it in a democratized way. I think that's incredibly powerful, and we're going to see so many new applications, so many new entrepreneurs and people who are solving their own pain, right? They can go and solve their own pain. They can create. I, I, am, I am so hopeful and so optimistic to see what these, generation, these new generations of kids are going to do with this stuff that we built, and they're going to stand on our shoulders and, and impress us all with what they can come up with. Thank you, Mr. Fadel, for being on the show. I, know I, I, I can tell you this much that you have made my life much simpler, much better with the products that you have made. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. Thanks for the time. So this is Nadagopal Rajan saying bye again. We'll be back next week with another great guest. Till then, goodbye. Wherever you listen to your podcasts.